A very good afternoon to all the attendees who are joining us here today for the Capital Insider Series as we talk to uh, Peng Ong from Monks Hill Ventures. He's joining us from Singapore today and he's going to really uh, talk to us over the next 45 to 50 minutes about what he sees happening in the venture capital world and what kind of startups is he looking to be betting upon um, as we go in the further months. And of course, uh, we're not we're not in the best of the economic climate right now. Things are very uncertain. Uh, global business, as we knew of it, has of course been shaken up, and we don't know when it is going to uh, regain its former status or at all be able to regain its former status. And so, given the fact that you know economies are becoming more internalized, every country is thinking more about its own population and how they're going to be able to increase the consumption over there. So things are changing a lot more in, from an economic standpoint than what they used to be earlier. So thank you for joining us, Peng. Um, you know, we, we're looking forward to this wonderful talk here with you today. Uh, let me uh, kick it off by introducing Peng to you. Now, Peng is actually an engineer and he's also um, a VC now uh, with Wong's Hill Venture. They are now at the second fund and they are more of an early stage VC, wherein they look and uh, uh, invest in companies pretty early. Uh, some of the most recent investments they have made in uh, are in a recruitment tool, which is called Glints, and of course, a very, uh, a very popular productivity tool that we are all using in India as well as in Asia and different parts of the world, which is Padlet and is also growing. Um, of course, uh, you know, Peng is going to tell us which sectors does he thinks uh, are going to be uh, going forward, going to uh, do great, and fintech, of course, continues to be a uh, one sector that Peng has always looked at very closely. On a personal front, Peng is a big reader. From what I've come to know is that he owns a collection of about over a thousand books uh, in his house, and we'd love to know about more what you read, Peng. But let me start off uh, the first question by asking you this, that today, you know, uh, I mean, while I understand that economies today are very different and, you know, businesses are looking very different from when we started the year 2020, um, but what do you think has changed in consumer behavior in terms of what is it that societies today are looking forward to buy? What is it that the consumer today who was looking to buy something else uh, in 2020 when it started is thinking today? So what? how do you think consumer behavior has changed overall? How do you think societies are sort of rejigged overall? And where, um, I mean, how do you think it's going to pan out to be once 2020 maybe is close to ending? So what do you think? You unmute. Please unmute, Peng. Please unmute. Yeah, typical problem with Zoom. Um, uh, we did prepare some slides. Thanks, Ritu. Uh, we did prepare some slides. Uh, my hardworking team actually uh, munched away at a whole bunch of stuff. So um, as I speak, I will switch over the slides uh, with your help. Um, and so, guys, if you could put on slide three. Um, so, um, that there, um, our view is, um, uh, in, in some ways, um, this COVID-driven uh, downturn is very different from all the other recessions you've seen, right? All the other recessions you've seen, things just get scaled down almost proportionately across the GDP. Um, what we're seeing is, uh, very different consumption behaviors. For example, Zoom is doing something like 100 million plus uh, MAUs right now. Uh, and it's just went public. It's a small company, no longer a small company because of COVID. Right? Um, that, that's sort of an extreme example, but you can look through all kinds of, of uh, 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 economic activities and you see it is very, very different. Um, in recessions, uh, what's similar is in recessions, people want cheaper, better stuff, better value for money. Um, and then you get all kinds of activities that move away from offline, right? Uh, from, sorry, from online, uh, sorry, from offline. And, um, you know, one, one of my friends uh, made the uh, comment, uh, he, he follows the US markets a lot. He, he made the comment that, you know, we've been talking about the end of retail for the longest time. But COVID-19 basically was the last nail uh, for re US retail. You know, it's very, very clearly the winner is Amazon. And uh, if you have a retail sh shop, it it's not going to do well. So 
you know, in the U.S., that's completely changed in terms of consumption. Uh, in our portfolio ourselves, we also see th this kind of trending. Uh, for example, um, th despite the fact that the whole of Philippines shut down the, uh, during the first few months of COVID, the Ninja Van, which is our last mile logistics company, it, it grew its uh, business year on year in, in some almost doubling it, right? In some very tremendous numbers, simply because people are just buying things online a lot more now. Um, so, so that's the more visible stuff and that's the less visible stuff, uh, less directly, like Ninja Van's business could have been supplying to restaurants, for example, and that would be a problem, but it was, so logistics could go either way. Right? So um, um, I, I think it's not just uh, a time of challenges, but it's also a time of opportunities. Sure. But I mean, from an opportunities, of course, you're right. Online shopping in India, we've seen a huge surge of hyper local e-commerce that became extremely important um, uh, in this time. Then, in fact, a complete new kind of, or I would say, subshoots of uh, e-commerce are now coming up, whether it's social commerce or whether it's hyper local e-commerce. So, do you think e-commerce, as you mentioned, I see in this slide that online shopping will be the new uh, new norm. But do you feel that? there will be different offshoots of uh, uh, e-commerce that will be seen in, in the days going ahead? No. I, I, think, um, I think the rest of the world, uh, emerging markets especially, will evolve differently from, from the US, which is basically one dominant e-commerce player and a few, number two, number three, but mainly one big one. Amazon is far bigger than any of its competitors. I, I think you see something like that too, but infused uh, in the rest of the world as we're developing the e-commerce world, but it's infused with all kinds of different selling, right? Uh, the the social, social e-commerce, as you mentioned, is a big thing out here in Southeast Asia. And thinking, I'm thinking it'll be a big thing in, in throughout, um, throughout uh, uh, Asia, uh, the emerging market here. Um, and, uh, and it's because um, the, the, the curation piece of buying needs to be done by someone. And I think we're more trust, trusting of our influencers than our big brands, right? And Amazon is a huge curator for the, for the developed countries, right? Uh, and we, we trust uh, when things are on Amazon and there's a rate rating, we trust that rating, right? I, I, I think that would translate to some of its uh, uh, emerging market successes, but I think not, not all of it. Right. So some, some of the other spaces will be occupied by influencers and other different selling platforms. Uh, the eBay equivalent, but much more modern, uh, like Shopee and, and, uh, and other kind of social selling platforms. Sure. I mean, uh, so, you know, as you said yourself, and this chart also shows that the new normal and therefore the business models look very different from uh, currently. So what opportunities, I mean, if you were to bucket them together, what opportunities would you see that ones that will really go out and flourish? And then there's some opportunities which will be, I would say, new form. And then there's some opportunities which will totally uh, go out of the window. They existed in a pre-COVID world, but would absolutely find hard to keep going in a post-COVID world. So how, yeah. how do you see these opportunities panning out as a VC? Uh, um, so I've, I've got a couple of slides on that. We can go to slide, um, I guess, five, yeah, slide five. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk through some of this stuff. Uh, Monksil is a VC that works, uh, we, we think based on first principles, right? Uh, Every time we look at a deal, we look at the entrepreneur and then we look at what they're trying to do and does that make sense, right? So if you look at the world today, uh, just into COVID, um, you know, there's a huge difference that has just happened, right? There, there, you can see there's a bunch of companies that are benefiting clearly from the COVID situation uh, everywhere. We've mentioned some of them, but others include uh, online education, uh, healthcare systems, uh, um, uh, digital entertainment, content is going crazy right now, right? Uh, so, 
um, a, a lot of my friends uh, who, with content businesses are seeing upticks of like 10% a month, 20% a month in revenues. Um, uh, and then you've got a, a whole bunch of businesses that are very clearly in trouble, right? If you are in the travel business, in your hotel business, uh, you know, anything that's live, uh, restaurants, all around that, you're in trouble, right? Uh, people have not gone out, let alone fl uh, flying for other country, fr uh, from country to country. So you, you notice that, um, oh, but by the way, I, the next slide is gonna make you think a little bit about, I think, what, what challenges, how unpredictable the world is gonna be given the situation right now. Um, the, the, the flying from country to country even, just thinking about what's gonna happen about that, around, around that over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, we don't even know, right? Um, so, so if you're in the travel business, you know, uh, if you're in the hotel business, for example, uh, you, you gotta think seriously about, you know, one major thing, runway, right? How are you gonna survive through this thing? Right, because you're you're not getting any revenues right now, and any way you pivot, your revenues is going to be minimal. Some some of the companies, some of the travel companies, are pivoting to domestic travel because you know you can still do domestic travel, but domestic travel is only a fraction of of international travel. So it, almost whatever you do is hard. Right, uh, the hotels here might be housing COVID quarantines. Right, so uh, you know those pivots are not very interesting. And then that's what we call bucket B right in the middle, which is the bulk of companies. You know, if you meet some random company, it's probably in bucket B. And bucket B is companies that supply to either the bucket A's or bucket C's. Uh, and it, we call the B minuses, the, the one supplying to bucket C and the B pluses, the one supplying to bucket A, quite a huge difference between your outlook if you if you're one of these right b b or b minus or b plus and then there's a whole bunch like a recruiting company uh, we have that is uh, bucket b neutral they have both b uh, a customers and c customers so um, this way of looking at things really helps you figure out what you need to do if you're one of these companies or if your customers is one of these companies obviously if you're bucket b neutral you're going to focus on the bucket A companies, right? The bucket C companies are not going to be consuming your services. So how do you, how does that affect your lead gen, your approach to value proposition, to selling, et cetera? So, you know, I think, and then there's a whole bunch of questions you can ask if you're a bucket A company uh, in terms of what happens when people have figured out how to survive COVID, economy starts getting back to the new norm. Can you start new habits that will keep your revenues high post COVID, right? Those are the strategic questions. Can you pick up great hires, great teams along the way as you uh, build great teams along the way as you build out, take advantage of your, of your good luck, basically. You know, I, I talk about this, which bucket you, you're in based on luck, right? You, you, you go to battle, you're standing there, and if you're in the wrong bucket, you get shot, right? Um, so, so that's sort of the, the way we've been looking at how to triage even the deals that come into us, right? How to think about them. Um, and um, if you go to the previous slide, um, I, I just wanted to throw out this slide to get the audience thinking about, um, the, the, um, about how uh, the previous slide is uh, slide four. Um, how, how to get the audience thinking about uh, how to uh, think through what's going to happen in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months. Um, my, this is the first time in the world, I think, where we actually don't know what's going to happen. There's so many things that... Um, will affect the economy and how the economy evolves over the next, uh, I'll say 12 to 24 months, that there is no easy way to predict. You know? uh, even 
as I mentioned earlier, a simple problem like flying. When can I fly to Jakarta again, right? On the normal commercial flight. What, what would be the pricing on flying? Even pri the pricing on flying is gonna go up very significantly because the roads are gonna be so restricted, right? And the, and, and the number of people traveling is gonna be restricted. So you, you won't be able to get these $500 deals to London anymore, right? Um, so how will that evolve, right? How, how, how will the lockdown and the ease of the lockdown change um, uh, change how countries behave, you know? Infection rates, uh, vaccination, all those things come in play as to how our economy will unfold. So from, from the first principles thinking, you're in trouble, right? Because you cannot reason your way through this because there's no, no predictability in what's gonna happen. You know, so the, the way we, we look at companies, we, fo we used to focus a lot, for example, how do you build a sales engine to predictably generate revenues, right? This is the first time in my whole career that I've said, well, that's not so important now. How much money are you making? Can you make some more? You know, I'm, I'm getting really practical in terms of the kind of questions uh, that we ask our companies now. Um, yeah, back to you. <laughs> that's true. I think, yeah, you're right. Predictability right now is going to, it's certainly gone down the hill in terms of understanding what could probably be the next uh, um, next achievable target to put forward to yourself and to your teams and startups that you're working with. Uh, so well said. You know, I remember uh, we met last year in Singapore um, uh, around the same time. And there was something that you'd said which still struck with me. And I was wondering now, post-COVID or amidst COVID, how does how is it going to pan out, which is what you said was that you see a real opportunity in servicification of technology. So what trends and opportunities do you see fitting into it right now? I mean, we've got a question also around that from one of our uh, attendees, which we'll come to later. But any deep domain service expertise trends that you are now sort of looking at, which will pan out in the times to come? Yeah. Let, let, let me start off with a simple definition of uh, technification of the service industry. Right? The service industry for a lot of emerging markets that are around you know, three, 4,000 GDP uh, is about half the GDP. So in Southeast Asia, we have about 3 trillion of GDP and about 1.5 of that is uh, in uh, services, right? Services include everything from retail to uh, Hit hunting to real estate agencies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, it's not manufacturing, not agriculture. So, technification of services. Uh, the the productivity of services is uh, tied around how how uh, effectively you can deliver that service, right? And as a result, it's a lot of that is information based, um, uh, and so you can actually use technology to drastically improve the productivity of that particular business. Uh, for example, uh, our uh, recruiting company, Glynn's, is, is not just shuffling resumes back and forth. It, it has uh, about somewhere between half a million to a million resumes in its database. So if, if someone uh, in Tangerang in, in Jakarta wants two JavaScript programmers with certain salary ranges, etc. What does the headhunter show them, right? Uh, and if you imagine this being a human process versus being an AI and automation process, you, the results can be day and night different, right? And, and so you can build a much more uh, effective um, uh, recruiting company if a lot of what you have is technology-based. You still need the humans there to work with the clients, to work with the candidates, et cetera, but they can be super, super productive because of that. So that's what we mean by technification, right? And the opportunities to me is really in Southeast Asia or in, in emerging markets in general um, to, to basically not just augment uh, the vertical champions with technology, but actually become those vertical companies themselves, right? So the largest, uh, uh, logistics company, uh, for example, in, in China is a tech company. The largest retail, uh, top three are all you know, tech companies. Uh, and you can go on banking, finance, they're all tech companies in China now. 
technification is over in China, well, not over, but has run its course in China. And all the huge, you know, China, China has about 5.5 .5 trillion in GDP in services. All the top ones or a large number of top ones are all tech companies. So that's going to happen in India, that's going to happen in Southeast Asia, it's going to happen in South America. Right? And um, I, I think uh, COVID hasn't changed that. I think COVID, in fact, because of the crunch in uh, um, the economy, is going to get that to happen faster, right? For example, um, uh, uh, well, I'll go back to logistics uh, as an example that uh, could be useful. N Ninja Van today delivers about uh, about more uh, around a million parcels a day. Uh, I, I don't have the latest numbers, uh, but it's around thereabouts. And uh, they do so with about the cost of $1 per parcel, right? Mm. It's about as efficient as you can get given the geographies in, in our region, right? Um, the, you cannot do that with human beings running around trying to figure out how to move a million parcels. You have to automate it. And as a result of the e-commerce demands, the, the pricing pressure uh, uh, of the environment, if you charge a lot more than that, or even a bit more than that, it's tough, right? You, you, it's hard for you to do a business. And the only way for you to be competitive is your technical too. You, you, you have technified your business. So I, I think COVID will, will cause the consumers to compress the technification cycles so that we get more uh, technology into our service verticals uh, over the next few years. Uh, and, you know, you ask for some deep expertise. I, I think what's going to happen is the service vertical champions you see over the next, I'd say, two, three years, they'll, they'll come out. You're going to see unicorns across all these different places. Uh, and um, they, they are going to be really using the combination of technology and operational excellence better than most people you, you can see on the planet, right? Uh, that's the only way to scale up these businesses and the competitive pressures will drive that. So we're, we're even more gung-ho about trying to find companies that are really good at technification in their verticals. I, I, I know I kind of didn't answer that what's the deep area that's useful, but I, I do see it across the services business. So lots of opportunities is what, what I mean. But I mean, you know, um, if you were, if I were to ask you this, that drone delivery, while I know it started, but do you think it's going to become like a Zoom of delivery? Do you see that opportunity happening now or sometimes later in the future? Not the next two, three years. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, drone delivery is an um, infrastructural change. It's a legal system change. Whenever that's required, uh, it all slows down to a halt until the legal aspects of it is taken care of, right? Uh, you know, countries like Singapore have always been very forward to make such changes and to bring uh, new things on. So do you feel in Southeast Asia it's happening in several markets? I know India could be very complex in yeah. terms of regulations. but you know, Even a place like Singapore, we don't have drones flying overhead to <laughs> know how to deliver stuff to us. It's, uh, the, it's a complex problem because it's about using the commons, right? The, 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 this part of the commons has not been used, right? The, the space may be above... 30 feet to 100 feet, or you know, uh, I guess you can convert that to meters. Um, but it, we don't know what the impact of it if we start using that, and and what if the drones fail and smash into somebody? You know, all, all these questions, how good they are, and not causing problems. So, you know, if you think through that, right? Uh, I, I'm a I'm a tech guy, I'm a computer science guy, so I'm looking forward to that tremendously. But every time when technology impinges on existing legal infrastructure and economic infrastructure, and ne that needs to change for the technology to come in, it comes to a grinding halt, or, or at least slows down tremendously until you know the infrastructure changes and the legal systems change. Sure. So coming down to the fund itself, Mong Sil Venture, I know that um, uh, the fund has actually raised about $100 million uh, very close to the pandemic. Sometimes I think just before the pandemic really became um, a big hit. 
and you know it's always said that raising a fund is 10 times harder than actually doing a startup i mean that's what i hear vcs always say so do you feel one of course how do you feel now when you actually raise this 100 million dollars to invest in startups at that point of time what what were what the kind of startups you're looking at and what kind of startups are you looking at now is one thing and secondly do you think for as a vc for you to raise further rounds of funds is it going to be more difficult um so it it is difficult uh, i don't know if it's 10 times harder you know if you are facing the problem you always think it's hard but uh right now what we know is the lps we're talking to lps are the people that invest in vc funds um they they're focused on other things right they're focused on on rationalizing their portfolio on you know recognizing the losses and all that huge problems they're having now so if you go to them and say i'm raising a fund they'll go come back next year or something like that right so ac actually just just practically we were raising our funds in in two two pieces our first piece was closed last year the second piece is going to drag on for a while right because no one's paying attention to this right now right you have a product to sell but no one's buying so you know it's hard to so so it's hard in that sense i think once the people get a hand off uh, over their current portfolio and the losses and gains etc they understand what's going to happen uh, they will start allocating again because i i think the the opportunities we have in south asia is just tremendous right uh, uh and and people will recognize that um the 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 consumption habits of you know uh half of half is it half of half a, a big chunk of humanity like one point something billion it, it's going to change in the next 5 to 10 years and i think it's huge opportunities to build very very significant companies so so they will understand to um uh to um it re resume the investment right at some point the lps will so um i'm not sure if i ans answered all your question all parts of your question there did did i miss yeah you, so the second part of it was that i mean you know when you raised the fund there mm -hmm. were some kind of startups you wanted to put money in are you still looking to put your monies into as a fund in similar kind of startups or is it now you thinking differently about the startups you want to invest yeah. in? well let's go to slide 8 and uh, i'll i'll talk you through how we thinking about investing again first principles is is still first principles uh, but slide slide 8 sort of describes roughly how we 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 look at companies right uh we, we do about 3 to 6 deals a year we, we're not a, a rapid fire investor so we will still maintain that and we've still maintained that right um the the buckets framework is a very quick way for us to um we we see about 1200 deals a year so the buckets framework is a very quick way for us to go okay we should look at these guys first because they are in an economy uh, or the sector of so the economy that will benefit from the the uh covid situation right now um and very importantly we've had uh less so now but we've had companies come up to us and say we need a million or 2 million to survive and we basically don't fund survival right to extend the runway we fund growth right uh and uh if you are in one of the bucket c uh if you're one of the bucket c players is really hard for us to justify in investing so any changes pre covid to post covid is around this right uh around this view of life uh, uh around the buckets view of life and the um uh, funding for so, uh, growth kind of view of life sure um another question that i have for you is that in, in your existing portfolio of startups mm -hmm. uh what is it that you have told them to do things differently i mean you know startups we know have been historically been growing through a lot of burn reaching out to customers with a lot of spending particularly when you look at consumer tech startups i mean the the burn that they have to reach out or to get the customers on board is very large so how are you telling them to rationalize their approach or what is it that you're advising to them in terms of you know uh, being i would say uh, a little more conservative with their uh, monies and you know not go out and spend too much and nevertheless you know when systems are changing they would have to spend a lot because they need to reach out to their customer in the best possible way so how are you trying to 
ask, asking them to balance it out um, um, to stay afloat. Yeah, it, it is really hard. Uh, I can I can tell judging from uh, uh, reactions uh, to not not just our portfolio, but to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs I've talked to, and the the reason is partly the 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 investment community's issue too. Uh, we've been in the habit of doing what I used to call negative blitz scaling, right? Uh, negative uh, unit economics businesses scaling up with lots of money, right? So uh, it culminated in the WeWork failure. So that's when people started realizing, you know, that might not be the way to build businesses and, uh, and, and slowing down on that. But COVID just slammed the brakes on it. You could see some activities about you know, uh, cranking up negative gross margins businesses, but that just stopped at COVID, right? So um, slide uh, 10, if you could put that up, is a very, very simple summary of what I tell my entrepreneurs, uh, my portf portfolio companies. If you don't have a runway, right? If you have no idea how long you're gonna last, uh, you're in trouble. So if you don't have, have visibility to at least 18 months runway, go make your adjustments until you do, right? And sometimes that means laying off half your, your folks. Sometimes that means going, get bridge down, done if you can. Mostly it's not about, if you get a bridge round, your company is probably doing okay, right? Uh, but you still need the runway. Um, and so, it's very simple. Can you get 18 to 24 months? If not, adjust. Your plan doesn't work. Right? And a lot of businesses that have uh, positive unit economics, my advice is even to tell them, assume you're not going to raise any more money with your three, five, six million dollars on the bank today. Go figure out how to make this a break-even business. If you can raise money, then you can grow faster, but that's next year, right? So it's a very practical view of uh, businesses now. You know, it's like businesses the way it used to be you know, 20, 30 years ago, right? Uh, where you just go, can I make money? If not, I, I don't go as fast. So what are you going to sort of look at as a new normal for startups when it comes to uh, their performances? I mean, you know, how, are, how have you rationed your normal for the startups who are already in existence in terms of what we are looking to uh, uh, achieve this year. So how yeah. have you rationalized the targets of achievement? The, the, the new normal is more um, the, the, the change, if that's one word, uh, and, and lack of predictability. So how do we uh, judge performance is really based on an assessment of how people are handling it. Now, we started off the year with some financial plan for you know, the, the 2020, uh, you know, and, and most of our companies are series B, C, A, B, C, and so on. So they, they've got pretty well worked through plans, et cetera. Um, for some of these companies, it keeps going. Uh, uh, Padlet, for example, in fact, their biggest problem was trying to make sure the servers don't crash because of the, you know, yeah. on the system. So, so those companies are, are, are doing better. So they're going to exceed their numbers, right? Uh, and if you ask them how much are you going to exceed the numbers, they go, uh, don't know, <laughs> because there's no easy way to predict this. Uh, they can do guesstimates, and they're gonna. So they're gonna do better than they expected. Yeah, they're gonna do. Um, but then there's a, a bunch of companies, the bucket B and C companies, that are in trouble, right? And so how do you judge the performance of those guys, right? Um, and and it's all you know if if basically a lot of these guys, their bonuses are out the door now, right? They, they're, they're trying to survive. Uh, uh, and so um, they're, they're rationalizing the uh, their current spend or the spend. This, this started three months ago. So the spend from three months ago to now, um, e even though we've had, you know, our partnership is, is made of operators, right? We used to run companies. Um, uh, it, we, what we're clear on is this is a scenario we haven't seen before. So what you really need to do is back to the basic equation, survival and, and uh, runway equals survival, right? It's as simple as that. How do we judge your performance at some level is, are you alive at the end of the year, right? 
Um, for companies that are doing a bit better, um, uh, uh, we, uh, for example, uh, we've got an online education company. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so a, co a company called Elsa is online education. It's got some offline, uh, it's got some uh, corporate components. So those are, are not doing so well right now, but the online uh, uh, co consumer version is, is doing fine, right? Um, uh, so, so we're not expecting huge misses in, in numbers for that one, uh, but uh, the uh, there's a whole bunch of businesses with B2C components that are just um, not, the, the B2C components are just not working right now because of various reasons. Uh, uh, the lending business, for example, uh, B2C, the banks are not, uh, the lead gen for the, the banks is just not happening. The banks are not lending, right? So, you know, if you have your own funds to lend, it's actually an interesting time because you need to figure out the risk, but if you can figure that out, you know, lots of people need working capital. Um, so a lot of the performance evaluation at the end of this year is gonna be subjective. Uh, it's gonna be how, how have you handled as a leader uh, all the changes that are happening, right? Frankly, if there are no ch changes, you almost don't need a leader, right? Um, but given what's going on in the world today, you, you need a very, very thoughtful, strategic, attentive, attentive to detail uh, set of leaders to take companies through this. Um, it, it's almost a cop out. I, I know, you know, it, usually, you know, at a, a level of performance in terms of revenues and all that, you're looking at CEOs and you're going, are they making the numbers and all that. Uh, this year, uh, that question, makes some sense, but not, not a whole lot of sense because you could be standing in the right place and a ton of money falls on you. You know, you could be standing in the wrong place and bullet hits you in the shoulders, right? So that's just pure luck. How you perform is how you handle it when the money comes in or when the bullet hits, right? Sure. Yeah, I agree. So we just got a question from Facebook Live uh, from Syed. He says that if you're looking at Asia Pacific for businesses, then is the local language going to uh, play an important role? So do you need to go vernacular or is English a good way to expand? So whatever startup is yeah. it that you're doing? Yeah, so this is a very good question. It hasn't changed pre post COVID. Um, I, I think um, I see a lot of companies coming from outside Southeast Asia trying to go local by having a very international product in English and all that. And that gets to maybe like 3% of the population. And if that's your target audience, that's fine. But if you want mass audience, it has to be local, right? It has to be local language. Uh, even in the Philippines where a lot of people speak English, you, you probably do need some kind of Tagalog version to get to the locals, right? So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost a non-question from our point of view, right? Uh, um, and even in India, I, I, I'm guessing, right, uh, the ones that wants to do mass, and I'm not just guessing, I, I do know uh, some of the entrepreneurs that are doing this, right? People go down to the local language across, you know, I, I've heard of apps supporting 20, 30 languages in India. Yeah, there are quite a few, but mostly we try to stick between English and Hindi. Uh, yeah. But yeah, if the, if the startup is very large, then they try to go more vernacular because then each state yeah would have different uh, variants of the same language, which right. is very hard to capture. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, Nena also who's asking a question. Can we have Nena online, please? Uh, Nena, can you ask your question, please? Uh, can you unmute and ask your question, Nena? Okay, though she's online, but she's not able to ask a question. So I'm asking on her behalf. Do you think startups should think of international expansion right now or should they wait? Uh, first of all, how are you gonna go international? <laughs> you can't even get a plane to fly to somewhere else. 
So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so just very practically, just just make sure you've got the solid revenue stream where you are right now. Uh, wait, wait until some of this travel stuff unfolds before you think about international, right? How are you going to find a partner uh, to, to run the business locally, right? You, you won't have met anyone local. You wouldn't have a, any sense, unless you've been to the target country or city, you won't have any sense of how it works there, right? So, uh, but even that's true for a digital business? Uh, to some extent. To some extent, uh, I've been involved in lots of digital businesses, content businesses that have localized and almost invariably you need a local team, even if it's a small number of people to tell you if what you're doing matches the local culture, uh, transaction requirements, etc. cetera. Uh, 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 compliance, right? The, the laws around what you can do and what you cannot do. So uh, I, I would say um, you, you, you'd be very brave if you were to go international today. And, and I also assume you're doing really, really well in your local business, right? So if you're doing really, really well in your local business, why not do even better and make sure you corner that market locally, right? And then worry about uh, going international when you can actually do it. Right? Sure. Uh, we had a question earlier, which was from Ayush, and he asked that, you know, in uh, so they, he's looking to do a healthcare app for uh, let's say within India, if ever, he was, it was the more rural economies. Yeah. Now, given the fact that you know, the audience might not be that literate, does it make sense to have an app or should there be another way to go out and uh, address their problems, which are healthcare problems? Yeah. I think that, that's a very uh, generic question on, a, on an issue that is very specific. Uh, I don't think there's a generic answer to that, even for India. I think certain parts of the economy in India are kind of tech savvy, even not necessarily the high end, but you know, the middle class uh, to lower middle uh, are reasonably tech savvy and can provide services online. Uh, same here in, in uh, Jakarta, in, in the Philippines, in Vietnam. Um, and then there are some, some other region, the GDP per capita could be about the same and they just, you know, don't, you know, when it comes to healthcare, they, go to look for their doctors. Um, again, you can look at this technification. Can you 5X the productivity of that kind of uh, business you're in? If you think you can, then you have a chance. Um, it's tough to do that now for healthcare specifically because you need to go um, recruit all these doctors uh, to be part of the system. And that's not clear. Um, you can do it now. Uh, versus if you had done this a year ago, then you'd be in reasonable shape, right? All the telemedicine companies are doing okay right now. So sure. uh, quick, quick answer is uh, if you can get to your suppliers, i.e. the doctors or healthcare providers easily at this point because of your connections, et cetera, then it might be a reasonable business to try. Right? If not, it's going to be really tough. Uh-oh. Are we frozen? Um, so okay. I, I missed the last two minutes. Okay, mm-hmm. sorry about that. So one of the questions is that you know, the businesses that were probably not meant uh, or not there for the digital economy, they don't even uh, update their static websites. Their websites continue to remain static. So, you know, what, what is your advice to such people, particularly given the pandemic and, you know, how businesses are going to pave out? That's what I'll speak, uh, what I'll do if I speak to one particular friend who's in that category and what I would expect of the bulk of uh, people doing that. So I, I've been part of uh, different governments, specifically Singapore government and sometimes Indonesian government's efforts in um, getting companies to digitize, etc. Right, And it, it is really, really hard. 
You know, people that are used to doing things in a certain way will do it until the point where the business is no longer viable and they'll shut it down, right? Instead of trying to pivot, et cetera. So for the bulk, I think the, the, com the, the companies uh, that are doing what, um, they're doing uh, sort of technically, uh, digitally deficient ways of uh, def deficient strategies uh, are not gonna change that much for the bulk, right? Uh, for for the in, any individual person, let, let's say um, uh, father son kind of arrangement, they've got a small family business. You know, if, if the son or daughter has the experience and exposure to e-commerce and all that, the tools we have today uh, to bring a business online is probably two orders of magnitude better and cheaper than they were five, five ten years ago. Right, so it's so much cheaper to get your business online now. It's so much easier to get your business online now. You don't have to. I I was walking one of my CTOs uh, past my old office in San Francisco, and I'll point to the the basement where we had our servers, and and I I, I told him, this is where we put our servers. He he looked back at me and go, why do you need to put the server anywhere? <laughs> the world has changed. You know, all these servers are virtual. They're all in the cloud. It's, and it's uh, you know, several orders of magnitude cheaper. So if you get yourself familiar with how to move your business online, and it's not easy, but if you figure out how to do that, then you see a different level of uh, business that you can play at. Uh oh, did I get cut off again? Hi, Pang. This is Puneet. I think Ritu has some connection issues, so I'll take over. Okay. Hi. Go ahead, Puneet. So, Pang, I have a question here. Uh, since you raised your second fund, so uh, the target markets for you are going to be the same, or in with this second fund, the startups that you are looking at will be from some new target markets? Any insight no, um, that you could share? No, we, we are, fund two is exactly the same as fund one, just larger. Uh, we're targeting Southeast Asia uh, cities, uh, companies oh. from Southeast Asia, from Vietnam to Thailand to Indonesia to the Philippines, etc. So it's going to be the same market uh, yes. again. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so another question that we've got—it's a bit uh, technical uh, thing, but it sure. says that. Uh, um, just a second, I'll read it out to you. Um, says something like, uh, how about cheap satellite servers, big storage memory synthesis that has a tighter orbit? Uh, okay, basically, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm a geek, so th these are good questions. Um, the, the, the way I'll answer it is uh, first world versus emerging markets uh, um, investing. So I spent uh, the bulk of my career in, in the US in Silicon Valley as, as an entrepreneur and engineer. Um, and then I spent uh, uh, about five years in China and now uh, so far about six, seven years back in Southeast Asia. I'm from Singapore. Um, and there is a very marked difference between investing in developed countries and emerging markets. Um, and that is how we focus on technology. Uh, it's a very simple thing. In, um, in the Valley, we do a lot in terms of thinking about how to build technology and how to sell technology, right? And that's how we create a lot of value. Uh, in, in emerging markets where the GDP is, I don't know, less than 5,000 uh, and, and growing, um, we focus a lot on how to uh, make the economy a lot more efficient than it is. Right. And China is one of the best examples of that. You know, China probably has the most efficient services sector now because of all the competition and, and all the investments that went into uh, tech companies the last 10 years. Right? And I think that's going to happen in Southeast Asia. So there is no right and wrong answer, right or wrong answer as to should I go do, you know, satellites and all these high tech stuff, right? My, my 
partner Guo Yi is a PhD in electrical engineering. I have a graduate degree in computer science. So I really appreciate that stuff and how it can change the world. And without that, we won't have the server farms. We don't have the global communication, et cetera, that enables all this stuff happening on the ground now to, to make our services more efficient. But in the end, if you're an investor, um, the biggest opportunities in emerging markets is they're not the tech deals, right? The tech deals meaning the tech companies selling tech. Uh, they are the tech services deals, the tech companies providing services that can grow to tens of billions in revenues. Try to grow, a, 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 try to sell technology and grow that to be tens of billions. It's really hard, right? Um, so um, I, I think uh, it, what you do, what you choose to do depends on where your passions are. There is no right or wrong answer to that. And do we look at satellite deals? Do we look at pure tech deals? Do we look at AV deals? Yeah, we do look at all that stuff, but in the end we invest in the services deals. Sure. You know, as we're approaching towards the end of the interview, we'd love to know what you are reading these days. We know that you're reading, you read a lot and you have a lot, big collection of books. So what is it that you're sort of focusing on? What are you reading about these days? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I, I try not to read too many business books these days. <laughs> uh, so what are you reading then? <laughs> uh, a lot of sci-fi. I'm going back to my roots. Uh, I, I, I think um, sci-fi makes you your mind be a little bit more flexible in terms of what's possible. Um, mm -hmm. Not not just in terms of technology, but in terms of how human societies are configured, etc. Right? Um, and um, sorry, uh, you, your connection just dropped. I, I couldn't understand anything you said there. So I said, any particular book that you would like to recommend to our readers? Oh man, there's so many. I, I just read, uh, but this is pure fun kind of book, uh, Red Rising uh, by P uh, Pierce Brown. Right? Uh, it's a popular sci-fi book. If, you, if, you, you know, you, uh, if you're in sci-fi, you know it, but uh, it's just like a Indiana Jones kind of uh, uh, book. Uh, uh, it's just lots of action. It also has some philosophical questions about you know, society and um, how meritocratic you want it to be, et cetera. Um, so very little to do with startups. <laughs> well, maybe that's got something to do with startups, uh, the, the, the meritocratic system. But um, yeah, so I don't know if that's helpful. But I, I find a lot of the business books like um, uh, that were out 10, 20 years ago, you read them and you go, well, yeah, that doesn't quite apply now, right? Uh, the, sure, the, authors, yeah. the authors get away with it because 20 years from now, nobody knew what they said, right? So, um, <laughs> um, so what you realize is a lot of what people thought of as uh, the last, you know, every 20, 30 years, people would say something about uh, management and that's the way it should be. And then you find out 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the examples are all wrong. Right? So, um, so I tend to get more first principles. I, I do read our articles, obviously, about the latest way people are uh, thinking about virality, about engagement, etc. but not books. Sure, and somebody is asking here that any specific reason why you're not reading business books? Oh, I just explained that. <laughs> because a lot, of, uh, <laughs> a lot of big books become obsolete within 20 years, or, or, or what they're saying was actually wrong. Yeah, they say these are the key success factors for this company, and then you know, three five years later, the company is dead, right? Yeah. Uh, so, um, I I think we need to get more rigorous. I I do read the books that are more quantitative, uh, that show numbers that drive certain things, um, but uh, th those tend to be in articles as opposed to books, I guess. You know, my final question to you is that I have been talking to a lot of startups recently who have got a model, model which is around really building digital avatars, whether they are event companies, virtual event companies, or they're essentially social uh, uh, sort of uh, social uh, companies which want to build, build a platform where I, so I called one of them actually a Roblox of, um, you know, adults or Roblox for 
elder people. So, uh, I mean, do you really feel these models, given the fact that we are so so much online, th th these could be workable in the coming time? Um, I, I, I guess the answer to that question specifically will depend on what the entrepreneurs are doing with, with the ideas. So I see virtual but, events is one that I have seen. Yeah. Um, and the second one is more really about uh, socially hanging out with your friends and um, so things like those. At least three of them I came across within the last 15 days itself. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost looking like a trend. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, we find trends and we go after them, right? So the given the put, geopolitical situation that's going on in the world, China, US, uh, and even like Brexit and all that stuff. Um, that there is, I think, an opportunity to knit the world together in a different way, right? From the geopolitical um, uh, situation. So I, I, I do believe, and, and COVID is sort of driving that a little bit, right? I, I do believe there are ways for governments outside of those big players to to get together to figure out ways for for us to be more seamless across borders right can a doctor in uh, uh, in Mumbai uh, service me when I'm sitting in Jakarta right? hmm. and uh, uh, actually the easy answer is yes uh, it, but it might not be legal where I am right um, uh, in fact uh, uh, in, in Indonesia, if you're not careful practicing medicine there, you could end up in jail if you don't have a license, right? Um, so so can, can we build a world that's more glued together virtually as opposed to geopolitical lines, right? And I think the answer is yes. I think we're starting to see it, right? Zoom is an American company owned by a Chinese national or started by a Chinese national uh, um, you've got all kinds of interesting uh, solutions that are created by people from all over the world that sort of knit people together, right? Uh, from from e-commerce, uh, Not I, I don't mean like Amazon, I mean things like Shopee, that's much more local, right? Um, to um, to a content and social, social, social platforms, right? They're knitting together hundreds of millions of people from different uh, walks of life. I've got a friend who, who started Smule about 15 years ago, uh, Sonic Mew, right? It's, uh, it's got a hundred over million MAUs of people playing music to each other across the mm -hmm. world, right? They're singing karaoke or they're playing a musical instrument. Yeah, I didn't think that was possible 15 years ago when he started the company. Uh, but I think the world is going to be uh, knit together in ways we will find hard to uh, imagine today. Um, I was watching a summary on Star Trek. Uh, uh, no, it was on Stargate, I'm a sci-fi fan. <laughs> and it was summarizing the nine years of Stargate. And uh, it was saying uh, the first episode uh, had uh, showed on Showtime and had uh, an audience of like 1.3, 1.4 million people, which was a huge number. Today, yes. we look at 1.4 million and go, okay, that's a rounding error, right? <laughs> we just look at audiences very, very differently now. YouTube videos right. you know, typically get to more than that, uh, just one YouTube episode, right? On a regular yeah. basis, the, the top, top YouTubers. Uh, and, and it's not unusual to have 10 million viewers, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I, I do believe that um, the worlds we live in will become virtual in ways uh, we find hard to imagine today. Um, and I, I hope actually the governments will enable that because I think that's the way to unlock some of the blockages that's happening on the, the, on, on the high end, right? The big companies having difficulties. We, we should figure out other channels that we can communicate with beyond the geopolitical lines. So that's my intellectual high level answer to that question. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I think uh, you're right. And I think one of the biggest takeaways I've had from this talk with you is that, you know, we need to, so we, while it's one thing to look at trends, but really it's better to look into more uh, science and see what problems could be or how problems could be faced differently instead of looking at business trends all the time. So I think 
that's that's a, a unique approach to look at things. And probably for a lot of people who are engineers or have a big interest in science, they can do things which are otherwise very hard. Thank you very much, Peng, for talking Thank to you. us. I really Thank appreciate you. your giving us this hour and uh, taking and helping. On, um, uh, in a more physical environment or an event environment. Till then, please keep safe. Thank you very much for joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.